thank you so much. And I'm very honored to be here, and I appreciate your taking the time to listen to me. Hydrocephalus is um, a thing I've been studying for nearly 40 years now. And it's not as um, easy as you want it to be and not as hard as some people make it. Um, and it does involve um, Chiari, uh, and I'm going to try to explain to you what that relationship is. Um, I, I put that up always so I can tell people that I've always, I, they, don't, they, ne they always get a fresh talk. Uh, I don't have any uh, conflicts of interest. Um, I do uh, consult for Codman once in a while. The biggest question when you're dealing with uh, people with Chiari and, and hydrocephalus is which came first, what caused what. And um, I think we have a pretty good idea of that, and um, that's what the subject of this conversation will be. So they share several things. Each of them is not an entity in and of itself, but something else causes it. It's not a distinct unifying en uh, entity, and so one of the things that we as physicians, and more importantly you as patients and families, are to try to figure out what, it ca what caused the problem in the first place. That's really important in hydrocephalus, and it's really important in Chiari as well. Um, the cause of the problem is a mechanical distortion of the brain or the nerves. So it's, it, it in and of itself doesn't mean you have a, a, a problem of, of, of the, um, the brain uh, itself. It's that it's being squished or stretched or something um, by some other body. The damage is caused by the distortion, and it's not the brain being the underlying cause. That's true of both of hydrocephalus and of Chiari, and therefore it, it sometimes makes it a little difficult to sort out which one to treat or which one to treat first. So hydrocephalus and other issues of CSF dynamics can cause Chiari malformations. And you're going to hear a, a repeated term. I, the British, primarily British people, call, don't call Chiari Chiari. They call it hindbrain herniation. And I'll explain what that means and why I like it so much better. Hindbrain hernias can cause hydrocephalus. And both hydrocephalus and hindbrain herniations can result from a common inciting event. So Chiari one, you've heard this before. Hans Chiari was a pathologist and all of his patients were dead. They were all children who died of hydrocephalus and at autopsy were found to have cerebellar tonsils in the, um, in, within the cervical canal. That was 1897. Real, really new thoughts have been hard to come by. That's 117 years. And hydrocephalus, the, the classification of hydrocephalus goes back over 100 years. Um, the, what is com communicating hydrocephalus? What I'm going to tell you is why hydrocephalus exists and how it, how it is affected by, by Chiari. Um, we'll just go on. Now, this is the way. Anyway, this is the way on the, on the far side is a brain that have ventricles in it. It has the cerebellum in it. And it, um, it is how we think about uh, the anatomy of, um, of the brain relative to hydrocephalus. The um, spinal fluid is made inside the ventricles by cerebral blood flow, comes out around the cerebellum, around the brainstem, into the spine, and then it comes back over the top of the head where it's absorbed. In order to understand it, it's better if you look at it like a circuit diagram, like, like a, an electrical circuit. The, the heart acts as a battery. The uh, blood goes into the brain, and most of it goes th through the brain to, to nourish the uh, brain itself and take away the metabolites. But 0.3 cc's, or a tenth of an ounce of um, spinal fluid, is made um, each minute. Um, and it has to, it's made in the ventricles. It passes through a series of channels and goes out of the fourth ventricle, which is where the cerebellum is, into the, uh, into the spinal, into the fourth ventricle, into the spinal fluid of the spinal subarachnoid space in the, in the spine, 
and then goes over the top of the head and is absorbed up here. So any place along that circuit, if you pinch it off, the, everything in, in front of that is going to dilate up. It's like a, uh, like a, a, a hose, you've, you've, it becomes tense, or like a water balloon. So any, t any place along there you, you see a blockage, then everything on the other side, on the front side of that is going to be bigger, and that's what hydrocephalus is. In, and in, in a way, that's actually what syringomyelia is too. It's the spinal fluid gets into the spine, the spinal cord, and can't get out again. And so it's a blockage um, either uh, in the uh, spinal cord itself or um, in, the, uh, in the fourth ventricle of the brain. Now this is, um, I took this picture at the Phoenix uh, um, Museum of Natural History. The top uh, skull uh, over here is a, a contemporary chimpanzee and the one furthest to the left is a modern human being. The middle one is Lucy, the Australopithecus afarensis. And what I'm trying to show with this, this uh, slide is that the size of the skull and the size of the, and the shape of the skull is, there's no pre-existing template for it. So what it reflects is the size and shape of the, head, of the brain. So if the, if the, as, the, as the brain grows, the, uh, thank you, as the brain grows, the skull gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And you see that in the, um, in the younger types, okay, in the, in the, in the chimp and in the pre-human hominid, uh, there's very little in the way of a forehead um, because there's very little in the way of a frontal lobe. Uh, also, the back of the skull is also uh, the shape of the cerebellum. And so um, the brain should continue to grow, and when the brain continues to grow, it should push out the back of the head. So that we should have a size of the back of the head, back of the skull, that reflects the size of the cerebellum. So there's no intrinsic way that that would develop, a, uh, that, that a, a carry malformation would happen in somebody who had a normal skull unless there's some distorting factor that creates that. Now there are things that we're going to talk about in a, in a few minutes that, that um, interfere with that. So there, I'm going to talk about Chiari 1 and Chiari 2, Chiari 2 only briefly. That's for patients who have um, spina bifida and it's much more severe than a Chiari 1. And it's, it, it is, it's fairly uh, straightforward. The, it's not just the cerebellar tonsils that come down, but the whole brain stem is in the cer cervical spine. And that goes far enough down that it blocks, it can block all of the exits from the fourth ventricle. So in a Chiari 1, only the foramen of Magendi can be, been, can be blocked because of, it, of the herniation. And there's always the ability of spinal fluid to get out through the side and get up over the top of the head. So um, it's much easier to figure out Chiari um, two patients as far as where their point of obstruction is. And this is, the, this is a picture of that. Um, the posterior fossa is very small because these, these children in utero are leaking spinal fluid into the, into the um, amniotic fluid all the time. And so this whole, there's no distension to make, this, make the back of the head uh, big enough to hold everything and it sucks down. Uh, so it goes way, way down, and the brainstem as well as the cerebellum come down in into the neck. Um, and so the skull doesn't form big enough uh, to, to, to hold this. That doesn't happen in Chiari 1. The, the, the Chiari 1 patients have a normal size, or most of them at least look like they have a normal uh, size back of the, of, of the head. But the cerebellum is actually, the cerebellar tonsils are down in the neck. And what happens is they create a stopper effect uh, at the foramen magnum so that the spinal fluid that's, that's coming out um, can, can get into the space on the outside of the brain where it can be absorbed, but it can't get down into, this, into the spine very easily. Um, so the neuroradiologists call uh, uh, Chiari 1 
or should call it carry one based on their own findings, anybody whose cerebellum is more than five millimeters down. That five millimeters is a, is a who cares? I mean, where did it come from? It's, it's, it makes very little sense that you can, you can say that four millimeters isn't a Chiari and six millimeters is a Chiari because they look exactly the same. Um, the, the problem is that there's a stopper in the bottle and that every time your heart beats, every time you take a cough or sneeze, this, the brain becomes bigger because cerebral blood flow goes in. And at that time, because the skull is a fixed volume, something has to get out. And when you have a stopper in the bottle, nothing, it's very hard for it to get out. So the, you have a piston that's pushing on the cerebellum and pushing on the nerves, and that's what causes the pain. That's, that can create a blockage of the spinal cord and cause the searings. All of this is because this is too, there's too uh, much tissue in a smaller container. So this is a skull. Uh, this is an MRI scan, in, with the, which is normal. There's a space behind the cerebellum which has spinal fluid in it. That's called the cisterna magna. This is a, um, a Chiari 1 patient with a de descent of the cerebellar tonsils um, and with uh, no spinal fluid behind the cerebellum. So there's no cisterna magna. This is a read as a normal MRI scan because the, uh, the degree of descent of the cerebellar tonsils is only one millimeter down. But look how sharply pointed the, the cerebellum is and the fact that we still have a stopper in the bottle. So it's the absence of the stopper, it's the absence of the cisterna magna that says, I have the physics of a Chiari malformation. Uh, this is the um, cisterna basilica in Istanbul. It, it could, uh, uh, so that uh, Istanbul could withstand a siege for over two years because there was enough water stored in there for their whole population to last for two years. And this is the cisterna magna. This is spinal fluid back here, and the spinal and the cerebellum is uh, is fine. And when I say when I look at a patient and and they're still having symptoms and they don't have a cisterna magna back here, I would say that that patient hasn't been adequately treated. So you have to have a cisterna magna in order to be adequately treated. So what does it do? In, in physics terms, it's a hydraulic capacitor. It stores water for future use. It's like the basilica, uh, the cisterna basilica. So it, it stores, stores it so that it freely can slosh up and down and slosh up and down so the pressure in the head never, never spikes up because the fluid can get out. It buffers the brain and spinal cord from compression at the time of neck movement. So it's got water back there that can change positions when you move your, your head. The, the, if, you, if you don't have that, the, the brain becomes torqued when you, when you have rapid head movements. And this is what a hernia is. This is an abdominal hernia, which uh, something that's, there's a hole here uh, in the abdominal wall and the, and the bowel goes out through it. So that's, that's, that's what a hernia is. And that's what's happening to the brain at the base of the skull. It's a, it's, I, I like to call it a hindbrain hernia because I think that takes a lot of the confusion out of it. It'll never happen, but please advocate for that with me. So um, there are many different causes of, of Chiari 1, of this herniation. It, it can be due to a, um, a skull abnormality like craniosynostosis. It can be uh, due to the, the, the herniation can occur if the spinal fluid pressure in the back is too low. If there's, a, if there's a leak of spinal fluid in your spine or you're getting multiple spinal taps, as we heard before, you can, uh, you'll actually suck the spinal, the, the, the brain stem and the, and the cerebellum down. So also, if there's too much pressure above, like you have hydrocephalus, that can push the spinal, the, the cerebellum down. So what does, Chiari 1 malformation essentially never can cause hydrocephalus. It can, it almost, it, it has to, unless there's an intense scarring or there's been an infection or something like that that blocks the pathways out of the fourth ventricle, the Chiari has to be 
uh, secondary to the fact that the pressure is too high, there's too much fluid and too much brain in the skull, uh, and it pushes it down. So, and we've heard that day already that if you do a Chiari decompression and the patient has hydrocephalus, which is high pressure, then your, your, your whole day is going to be ruined because you're going to have a leak for sure. You're going to have a pseudomeningus heal, you're going to have a leak, you're going to have to go back in, and eventually you're going to have to treat with a shunt. In general, you should always assume that the uh, hydrocephalus has caused the Chiari. Um, sometimes the, the, the symptoms are Chiari symptoms, tussive headaches where you cough and it gets, it gets worse. But that does get better when you treat the hydrocephalus either with a third ventriculostomy or with a shunt. So there are situations in which the, uh, the Chiari probably causes the, um, the, the hydrocephalus, and this is the, uh, in, in special kinds of patients who have craniofacial problems, um, and the, there's a blockage of the, um, the, the venous drainage so that there's a herniation of the cerebellum that's so severe that the ventricles uh, get bigger, and you have to do both. You have to take care of the hydrocephalus, and you have to take care of the, um, the Chiari as well. So if the hindbrain hernia, if the Chiari 1 malformation occurs with hydrocephalus without an obvious cause, my job is to find out where the point of obstruction is because that'll define what kind of treatment's needed, define the, how long it's been going on, and if the patient is symptomatic, are the, patient, are the symptoms due to um, the hydrocephalus or are they due to the Chiari? Sometimes they're due to the hydrocephalus, sometimes they're due to the Chiari. Usually when you treat the hydrocephalus, the symptoms of the Chiari get better. Um, if you decide if the neurosurgeon decides to treat uh, the, the Chiari um, and the ventricles are large, um, I would always recommend putting an intracranial pressure monitoring device in at the time of the, of the Chiari surgery. And if it's high, I would shunt early rather than later because we know they're going to develop problems later on. When hydrocephalus and hindbrain hernia coexist in a patient, and the patient is symptomatic, then the treatment of the hydrocephalus is the um, likely uh, cause of this. Um, you can have large ventricles for a very long time and not have any consequences of it. And so if you do ICP monitoring, sometimes you can not treat the hydrocephalus with a shunt because it's not a shunt, it's a sentence, and, uh, and treat the hindbrain hernia, but you need data on, um, on the intracranial pressure. It's really important, the take home message here for this is that you need a cisterna magna to be able to, to balance the pressures above and below the uh, frame and magnum, which is the goal of surgery. And it's very important to recognize that sometimes a headache is just a headache. And if you continue to operate on people by changing shunts or, um, or continuing to do surgery, um, it you're, you're going to make things uh, worse and not make things better, the patients will suffer. So I routinely do a lot of ICP monitoring, intracranial pressure monitoring, to prove whether it's, um, uh, so we have an objective reason um, to intervene. Um, and um, the, whether that be with the, with the Chiari, if the Chiari has been treated and there's a cisterna magna, you've done everything that you can. If the ICP is normal, um, then the shunt is working or the shunt is not needed. This is, a take -home, this is the take home message. This is the way uh, your neurosurgeon and anybody who has hydrocephalus should look at this. This, uh, this diagram was from several of my articles and it was just uh, recently adapted by the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, for their um, uh, course on for the for the pediatricians getting their boards. I'm very proud of that. That's this way of looking at it uh, is new. It was first published in 2010. Um, thank you very much for your attention.